good writers that tell us something about consciousness are just fantastically good at doing the game of what it would be like to be a blank. Um, and in, in my world, knowing what it's like to be a chimpanzee, it helps if you hang out with a lot of chimpanzees. You're not just a good writer. Um, so I think all, all the time she spent trying to get inside their mind is fantastically good. And if you, if you read some of her pieces aimed at a popular audience to try to describe what it's like to be David Greybeard or one of her favorite chimps, you get a, a fantastic look at that. But, but my read is that it's, it's, it's about writers being good at getting inside the heads of other individuals. And that's not necessarily a good scientific understanding of consciousness or figuring out the problem that we've been up here talking about. It's the kind of person who has a good set of system one intuitions about just plopping inside somebody's head and then describing back to the readers, like, what is it like to be, like, that kind of thing. I'm going to go for Proust. Uh, yeah. you know, I'm really interested in phenomenological methods. Representing, one of the big questions, the challenges for the science is tools to accurately describe and represent states of consciousness, which we're not terribly good at. You know, we need a better phenomenological method. And you look at, look at Proust, he's a master phenomenologist, characterizing his states of consciousness in, uh, in, uh, in vast, gory detail. And I think that's one of the things we can look to, uh, to writers to do. And the question is, can you take that and make science of it? Other oh. literary influences? I mean, all those I would mention have already been mentioned. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oliver Sacks would be the one that you know I'm most current with. But and again, you know, the the issue arises. Those people speak to your intuitions. I mean, they do something that feels right. So it is really quite interesting. And. You know, for me, that's the way I've thought about many philosophical questions ever since I was a child, that the psychology of our philosophical intuitions is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And the psychology of, you know, what, you know, why some accounts of consciousness appear appealing and others don't, as a psychological problem, is fascinating. Even if I really don't think the problem can be solved at all. <laughs> but. The psychology is good, <laughs> or can be good. So I think it's a great question. And what's coming to my mind immediately is when you asked about consciousness and self, my answer is consciousness first, because I've been reading Helen Keller, who is an incredibly amazing writer. But she's in, in the end of her life, or, not, or a later book that she wrote called Teacher, about Anne Macy Sullivan. She talks about her real feeling about who she was or what she was before Sullivan taught her language. And it's amazing because she, does not, she doesn't attribute a self-identity to the conscious being that she was. She actually labels it phantom. And she describes it in detail as an entity that was just being you know, pushed around and reacting. And usually violently, and usually with limbic drives, and it, you know she's an eloquent writer. And it's not it's not the focus of her book. It's mostly about how Sullivan taught her and what it meant to her. But it, it, that section for me is very interesting. I've been reading it and thinking about measurements and thinking about this general issue. But that, that that's and that's that's one that maybe you won't hear. Can we ask the narrator? Okay. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, William James is, is one of my heroes who has been mentioned here, and I just, I am astonished at how contemporary he still is. Yeah. I mean, I, a book like Variety is a Religious Experience, and I have a particular interest in questions about science and religion, and but he's just, I think he's still asking questions that, uh, that most people don't even talk about still. I, I find him stunning. 